Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. What is a tradition near and dear to your heart? I know you've got one. Each one of us has something that inevitably pops into our head when we hear the word tradition. And maybe it's a tradition at the church you grew up at. Maybe it's a family tradition. Maybe it's a community tradition in the neighborhood that you grew up in or that you live in now. But we all have traditions. But lately in our culture, and this is reflected in a specific way as we'll see in the text, tradition has sort of taken on almost a universally negative connotation. It's seen as synonymous with the idea of being stale and unchanging and boring. Yet, strangely enough, despite that negative definition, we all have them. We all have traditions. It seems an inevitable part of our humanity to establish them. There are traditions in every aspect of your life. Some of them you probably won't recognize by the title tradition, but that's essentially what they are. There are traditions everywhere in sports. I hear there's something called a terrible towel here in Pittsburgh as a tradition for the Steelers, and I'm sure I'll discover many more the longer I live here. You maybe have some home life traditions. Maybe it is a tradition in your family that no matter what's going on, we are sitting down and having dinner together. That's a tradition. Or maybe it is your morning routine. Maybe you're one of those people that you got to have your morning routine exactly the way you like it, otherwise your day gets off to a rough start. You get up and go on a walk and get your cup of coffee before you get going. I had a friend, if I asked him, if I came up to him and said, good morning, and he hadn't had a cup of coffee yet, he would say, well, it's morning. But we also have traditions in the church. Right, particular styles of worship, particular acts of piety that maybe we do as individuals or maybe that we do as a congregation. So we're all familiar with tradition. And in our gospel reading today, Jesus offers a pretty harsh teaching on what he calls the traditions of men. So it may make you wonder, are all traditions bad? Should we refrain from establishing these traditions, which would be really tough because some of them are just so special to us. Well, before we dig into the text, I, I have a philosophy major, so i got to define the terms. So let's define what exactly we mean when we say tradition. So here's the dictionary definition of tradition for you. The transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation or the fact of being passed on in this way. In other words, it's the actions and beliefs that you want to pass on. It is a form of wisdom. For example, if you found that you live a healthier and more fulfilling life by rising earlier in the morning and walking, going for a nice walk and having a cup of coffee, and that becomes your tradition, because it works so well, you typically don't keep it to yourself. For those that, are, that you care about, you share that tradition with them because you think it'll help them. So you pass it along. Or to use a church example, perhaps there's a posture or a song or a hymn or approach to worshiping God that many have found helpful in focusing on God when they're worshiping and that it keeps their worship faithful. They then desire to pass those customs and practices to the next generation so they too can have those same benefits. In the text, Jesus speaks of the traditions of men negatively. Does he mean all these traditions we're talking about? Well, let's look at what he says. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of 
of men. This is an accusation that Jesus levels against the Pharisees. And we get our first qualification on what Jesus is talking about here. He sets up an opposite. So he doesn't say, all your traditions are bad. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. They've been pitted against one another, in other words. So Jesus isn't condemning all tradition, but he's condemning any tradition that sets itself above or in opposition to God's commands. He accuses them with these words that they're teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So a good church example would be Let's say we decide at some point, or maybe you've been to a church that does like a procession with a cross, right? That's a fine practice. But it becomes sinful if I or anyone else says that must be done. Because then we are placing a tradition we've established over a command of God. We've, or we've tried to turn it into a command of God, and thus working against his intentions. So the Old Testament commandment that Jesus refers to here comes from Leviticus chapter 22, the rules of cleanliness, right? So the Pharisees are accusing Jesus' disciples of not following the ritual cleanliness rules. Now to clarify, this isn't talking about like they've got oil and grime on their hands and they didn't wash them, okay? This is talking about the ritual purification Right? And that's what they're taking issue with. Now the motivation of the Pharisees, as Jesus knows, is they're trying to use a technicality of rabbinic law to hurt Jesus' credibility and prevent his mission. And so Jesus' response is quite strong to this effect. Because they're putting their own rules above God and his commands. Not only that, but they're trying to do it to prevent Jesus from fulfilling the Father's will. So, the Pharisees have adapted this tradition as well. In the Old Testament in Leviticus 22, these ritual cleanliness rules are for the sons of Aaron, which means the priests who are serving in the temple, and it was for the holy places. So this was not a law or command given by God that all people ought to follow at all times. And so things had been adapted, and not only had they been adapted, but now they're being, instead of being used in service to the worship of God as they were intended in the Old Testament, they're now being used in opposition to God and the ministry that he sent Jesus to do. And so then Jesus says this statement that I find personally quite convicting. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, Jesus didn't condemn the tradition, but the place that it now has taken in the lives of the people who follow it. That it has been elevated to a level above God's command and now is in fact being used to oppose God's will. It's no longer working in service to God, but now it is fighting against his purposes. Now, when we say that and we're looking at the Pharisees, it's always really easy to be like, what do they think they're doing? How could they make such a silly mistake? Seems obvious when Jesus explains it, right? But let's be honest, this is a struggle for us as well. Now, you may not be struggling with keeping the traditions of the elders and the ritual cleanliness laws of Judaism. But we have our own traditions that often take the place higher than God's commands. How often do we place our own traditions where God's commands ought to be? Think about it for a moment. Especially in light of that phrase that they praise me with their lips but their heart is far from me. How often have you, in favor of family vacation or family tradition, felt it's okay to not go to church? Or perhaps for sporting cultural traditions, 
we can skip out on something like that. Or maybe we'll spend more time on that than we'll spend on reading God's word and serving others as he commands. Maybe a phrase you're familiar with, and most of us, when it's applied to somebody doing this to us, would agree we despise this, is lip service. When you say somebody gives something lip service, it says they claim that they believe this thing or do this thing, but their actions say otherwise. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But the sinful flesh that still clings to us might want to protest. But what about noble traditions? Sure, it's easy to understand what Jesus is saying when we're talking about things that are just of this world, like sports or maybe a small family tradition. But what about if it's a tradition that has a noble cause beyond ourselves? Well, actually, Jesus gives an example that falls into that category at the end of our gospel reading. Now, you may not have understood that in there because you're maybe not familiar with the idea of Corbin, so let me explain. So Jesus accuses the Pharisees of hypocrisy, that they are breaking the very same law they're trying to hold the disciples to. And he says, in Moses, you were given a command from God to honor your father and your mother. All you catechumens out there, that's number four. And he says, instead, now you have supplanted that command to the traditions of men by saying that all that you have is Corbin, that is, given to God. Sounds like a noble cause. Give all your stuff to God. That's a cause beyond myself. It's in service to God, except I've decided to take my service to God outside of what he's asked me to do and what I think he wants me to do, or rather into what I think he wants me to do. And so a a Corbin was actually an offering to the temple that was over and above the required tithe in Mosaic law. So this is what they would give in addition to what they've already given. And Jesus is saying here that you should be using that to take care of your elderly parents and not giving it to the temple. Again, God's command, our ideas and traditions. So Jesus condemns this practice of placing traditions over and above the commands of God. And he's teaching us a simple truth. If it is a command of God, nothing, not even our noble traditions, are placed before it. Simple to understand, but not easy to follow. You may be feeling a little bit despairing. I know I am. The law of this teaching shows us, exactly like Jesus shows the Pharisees, the hypocrisy of our own faith in God. Each and every one of us puts things before God that ought not to go there. Traditions, our own ideas, our own words, our own conception of the noble cause. And this is what we're doing every time we skip church for some sort of familial or sports tradition or personal, or community tradition. This is what happens anytime we put our desires or the desires of our culture over God's commands when it comes to worship, when it comes to service to the neighbor, and when it comes to actively teaching the faith in your home, when it comes to how you spend and use what God has given you. And we're left wondering, what hope is there for such hypocrites as us? So easy in this text to point at the Pharisees, and yet that's where we are too. Well, the gospel here is that Jesus came to fulfill God's plan of salvation despite trying to be stopped by hypocrites like the Pharisees and hypocrites like us. He doesn't let them deter him from his mission of fulfilling God's will. And God's will is this, that he sees and takes your faithlessness and mine and that of the Pharisees and that too of his disciples and in exchange gives us his perfect steadfast faithfulness and the forgiveness of sins won on the cross and in the empty tomb. 
It's a salvation, a gift that can't be earned or bought or won by righteous action. It is only won through the perfect righteous action of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you now live under grace. But grace has not removed the law. It has merely removed the law's condemnation of you. And so we are still called to strive to follow Jesus' teaching here. To keep his command first and foremost in our hearts. So I have a challenge for you. Find a tradition or idea in your life that you have regularly placed above God's word. Strive to turn away from that habit. Maybe you can alter that tradition to actually serve the command that God has given you. Or maybe you need to give it up. Strive to turn away from such things and serve the command of God. You'll fail, so will I. Yet don't be discouraged because you no longer live under the condemnation of the law, but in the grace of Jesus, who has forgiven all of your sins and given you the life everlasting and called you his own. In the name of Jesus, amen.